By now, I hope you have a decent idea of how we can create and use machine learning models in embedded systems. Before we end, I'd like to talk about a few implementation strategies that you should keep in mind. How do you know what threshold to use? Is 0.6 good enough for your application? There are a few ways to find that out. One good way is to create a histogram of your target label predictions from the validation or test set. We run each sample from that set through our model and record the target label's confidence score. We then create two histograms, binning our scores. The first histogram is our true positives. Using our keyword spotting system as an example, perhaps you're looking for the keyword hello. So we'd create a a histogram of all the probabilities of the label hello when the samples used were actually of hello. Ideally, these values should be close to one, indicating that the model was sure of its predictions. We then do the same for all of the samples that were not originally hello. Here, we would create a separate histogram on the same axes that represent the true negatives. Often, you'll find that these histograms follow a Gaussian or normal distribution, creating an obvious bell curve. Sometimes they won't, and that's not a big deal. What we really care about is the separation between the distributions. If you see obvious separation between these two sets, choosing a threshold is easy. Just pick a number in that separation. For example, in this ideal case, we could just pick 0.5 and be pretty confident that our system would correctly identify our keyword. However, most machine learning applications are rarely ever this neat and orderly. You'll often see something that looks like this when you plot the histograms of your target and non-target predictions. There's a good bit of overlap, so choosing a threshold is not so easy anymore. If you pick 0.5 again, you would reduce the number of false positives, but you'd miss out on a lot of true positives. Here, non-target samples could still be classified as the target label, which is a false positive, and target samples could still be classified as a non-target label, which is a false negative. If you slide the threshold back to something like 0.3, you'd allow for more true positives, but you'd also get a lot more false positives. At this point, picking a threshold is up to you. Are you okay with more false negatives or more false positives? If you're building something that's for detecting a disease or maybe some kind of security system, you might be okay with more false positives, but you absolutely do not want false negatives. This might require more human intervention to examine the output more closely to see if something is a true positive or false positive with an additional test or more screening. For something like a keyword spotting system, you're probably okay with more false negatives, but you do not want it to trigger on keywords that sound similar to your target word. In this case, you probably want a higher threshold to minimize false positives. Another way to view the effectiveness of this classifier is by constructing a receiver operating characteristics curve or ROC curve. The x-axis is the false positive rate and the y-axis is the true positive rate. We then slide an imaginary threshold over our histograms, computing the FPR and TPR at each threshold. At a threshold of 1, we won't have any true positives or false positives. This continues until a threshold of 0, where everything is a true positive or a false positive. The shape of this curve gives us an indication of the accuracy of our classifier. You can calculate the area under the ROC curve to get a single number between 0 and 1 that gives you a simple quality score for your classifier. A perfect classifier would have an ROC curve that looks like this, and the area under the curve would come out to be 1. This means there is perfect separation between the classes, and you can find a threshold that gives all true positives without any false positives. The worst possible classifier looks something like this, where the true positives overlap with your false positives. This means your classifier cannot distinguish between them, and you'd waste a lot less energy by just taking a 50-50 guess for the label. Here, your ROC curve would be a diagonal line, and the area under the curve would be 0.5. So most classifiers will have an AUC between 0.5 and 1.0, with a higher number indicating a better classifier. I'd like to talk about the idea of determinism in machine learning, because working with probabilistic data can sometimes be daunting, especially with embedded systems. When we manipulate some kind of input, whether that's just averaging things, calculating the Fourier transform, or using a Kalman filter on some sensor data, we expect a level of determinism. That means if we put one set of inputs into this calculation, which I'll label as a generic function h of x, we expect to get some output, y, every time we put in the same inputs. If we use the same x every time, we expect to get the same y every time. Only when we change x do we expect different y values. On the other hand, 
If the function was not deterministic, it would be probabilistic. In this case, it would also be known as a stochastic function. Here, the output does not remain the same between executions of the function, even if we're using the same input. That's because a stochastic function has some level of randomness in it and can therefore produce a random result. The output may be bounded, as I've shown in this example, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Here's a question for you. Is a neural network deterministic or probabilistic? We spent so much time talking about probabilities that you might think a neural network is a random or stochastic function, but it's actually deterministic. Well, at least the ones we're working with. Stochastic neural networks might be a thing of the future. Even though the training process requires a lot of randomness in choosing initial starting weights and dropout layers, once a model is trained, it will always give us the same outputs if we use the exact same inputs. That's because a neural network is simply a collection of multiplication, addition, and nonlinear operations. There's no randomness inside the model itself. This can be hugely beneficial when testing your model. If you develop and train your model on your computer or a server, you can use one set of inputs and record the model's outputs. Then copy the model to your embedded system and try again using the exact same set of inputs. If the outputs match the ones you got from running the model on the computer, then you know your model transferred correctly to the embedded device. Converting a model to run on your embedded device often requires several steps and could be prone to errors. So this is a good way to know if everything works. Worked. All that being said, Edge Impulse handles the conversion process for us so we can be fairly sure that a forward pass through the model on our computer will match a forward pass on our microcontroller. However, please keep in mind that we often treat neural networks as probabilistic when we're talking about unknown data being used as input. If we don't know what's being used as input, then we can't know what the neural network will ultimately predict. This is why we use statistics to analyze the data as well as the model's output. We're looking for trends in that data in order to construct a model that will generalize those trends, even if the model itself is deterministic. I'd also like to discuss a few ways to use the output scores. The first is to employ a moving average filter to help reduce noise in the output. You'll see a moving average used a lot when tracking data over time, like the stock market. There are a number of different kinds of moving average filters. The most basic one is the simple moving average. This is computed by taking the most recent data point and averaging it with a number of previous data points. Let's say we're looking at the confidence score of our target. In this case, we'll assume we're looking for the keyword stop. Remember that our keyword spotting example on the Arduino gives us probability scores for our labels three times every second. A two-point moving average filter would average the most recent confidence score with the one before that. That would give us something that looks like this. For example, we can have our system trigger an action only when the moving average is above a threshold rather than the raw confidence score. When it comes to keyword spotting, this can help fight against false positives that might look like our keyword. The spoken word stop Bing might cause the confidence score to rise as the model hears the first part stop, but then immediately drop as the ing part wasn't what it was looking for. It needs a pause after stop to truly match the target keyword. A moving average can help prevent these types of issues. The downside is that they introduce some lag into your system. It now takes an extra cycle or more for the moving average to catch up, which means that your action won't trigger right away when the keyword is detected. Another technique that you might be able to use is hold off. This is where you stop performing inference for a while after your threshold condition has been met. If we plot our CPU utilization time for our keyword spotting system, it will look something like this. The CPU is used for about 135 milliseconds out of every 333 milliseconds for feature extraction and inference. That leaves only about 198 milliseconds left to perform other actions. One way to reclaim some of this is to stop inference after after your event has been triggered. For example, this might be that an anomaly has been detected or your keyword has been identified. You may need to stop the continuous inference for a while to perform your action, and that's okay. Be aware that you might miss other instances of your event, though. The Amazon Echo does this. Whenever you say Alexa, it will stream input to the Amazon servers for a few seconds, which is the action trying to figure out what you're asking of it. During this time, it won't respond to Alexa again. Once you're done with the action, you can go back to continuously looking for the event.
Finally, something else you might consider is having a separate microcontroller just for running your machine learning application. For example, we could have a smaller microcontroller like an ARM Cortex-M4 connected to our microphone or other sensor. This microcontroller would be in charge of just reading the sensor and performing inference. Then it could notify our main microcontroller that an event has occurred by toggling a pin or by sending a serial or I2C message. We are already seeing special purpose chips being made to fill this role of coprocessor, but know that you can also accomplish it with a general purpose microcontroller. It might require more power and more code, but it also might be cheaper. In the future, we might also see special purpose machine learning coprocessors or accelerators being built on the same silicon as the main processor, like we're seeing on Apple's M1 chip. I hope that these techniques have given you some ideas on how you can use the output from your machine learning model in your embedded system. Thank you.